February is Heart Month, and today we are talking with cardiac and heart transplant surgeon, Dr. Ayez Ali. Dr. Ali is brand new to Hartford Healthcare. S welcome, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so you specialize in cardiac surgery and heart transplant. Um, first, let's talk about heart transplant. What are the statistics here in Connecticut? So uh, last year in Connecticut, it was a great year for people who needed heart transplants in Connecticut. Um, in the state, between the two hospitals, we performed 71 heart transplants. And that, for uh, considering the population of Connecticut, we transplanted people at the highest rate of any state in the country. So we performed 20 heart transplants per million population, which is twice the rate, which is the average for the United States. So we were able to provide heart transplants to the many people who are waiting. One of the issues with heart transplantation is unfortunately, although there are many people in need, we aren't able to deliver the need to all those patients. So there are many waiting, whereas we're limited in being able to provide that therapy because we have to uh, rely on the logistics, of course, of waiting for suitable organ donors to, to become available to us through the gift of the generous gift of donation. Absolutely, and mm -hmm. I, I want to talk about, and in, in throughout your illustrious career, mm -hmm. you've performed over 150 heart transplants, which is, which is astounding. Um, but I, I want to talk about sort of the selection process, mm -hmm. um, because in heart transplantation, um, in centers across the country, they may not be implanting certain hearts mm. because of age, and mm. but you take a different approach to this, uh, which I think is fascinating. Talk to us a little bit about that. So we're, we're all unique as human beings and as people, even when we get sick and we obviously we need uh, treatments and procedures. And each heart transplant potential recipient or patient is unique and has their own characteristics, as do the donor organs that were offered, again, from the generous people who decide to donate their organs um, through the processes that are available. So when we have people waiting for a heart transplant, we are constant. And so initially, obviously, when you're considered to be suitable for a heart transplant, you're placed onto a waiting list. And that's how the logistically we are able to deliver heart transplantation worldwide. And those people who are on that waiting list, they wait. As by design, right. they wait. We are receiving almost daily offers for donor organs. And we have to match that donor organ to the potential recipients for which that heart is being made available for. Mm -hmm. So we have to, again, match a lot of things between the donor and the recipient. So size, we can't transplant a heart from a much smaller person to a much larger person, or even sometimes vice versa. So we look at their height, their weight. They have to be blood group compatible. We can't transplant a, one blood type into another, otherwise there's an immune reaction that's very focused and severe against the heart. And other characteristics as well, that donor hearts, just like ourselves, come from people who have different issues, different conditions. Sometimes we'll use hearts from people who are somewhat older than we may conventionally consider. So in the United States, the average age of uh, heart donors is much lower actually than most of the world. So we're quite mm -hmm. conservative in the organs that we select. So the average age of a heart donor in the United States is around 25, whereas in Europe, it's about 20 years uh, higher right. than that. So the average organ donor in Europe is now about 45. So Again, using my experiences, because I trained and uh, spent a lot of my career at Papworth Hospital in England, which is the major cardiothoracic center in England and one of the largest in Europe. Because we have fewer donors available to us in Europe, we have to reach out and look harder yeah. in order to find suitable hearts. And again, one of the things that's uh, disappointing in some ways, but also an opportunity, is that we only use about 50% of the hearts that are offered to us in this country. So 50% of hearts that are offered to us are actually discarded and not used at all. Which probably could be used. Well, we right? look, not all of them. Not many all, of them, many right. of them are declined for very good reasons. Right. But if we look very hard mm -hmm. in that pool of discarded organs, we can frequently find donor hearts which are usable. Right. And so that's really what I focused on, and that's what was taught to me by my mentors and by my the people who were gracious enough to train me and the organizations where I've worked and which have been really focused and in delivering heart transplantation. This is what I've picked up, obviously, in my career, and that's the philosophy that I've used. And using that, we were able to grow my previous program to record levels and to a top 10 U.S. heart transplant program. And I'm very pleased to be here at Hartford Hospital. And um, again, very much looking forward to being able to deliver timely access to heart transplants to, to patients uh, at Hartford. Yeah, which I think is so remarkable how you're, you know, just looking at it as a whole, but really finding ways to make mm -hmm. hearts viable in patients. Uh, you're brand new here to Hartford Healthcare, here at Hartford Hospital mm -hmm. uh, Transplantation Program. What is your vision for the program here? 
So again, as a thing, first thing I'd like to acknowledge is that we already have an excellent heart transplant program at Hartford Hospital. And the results, the survival results at Hartford Hospital are amongst the best in the country. And we performed record numbers of heart transplants here last year at Hartford, we think 22 heart transplants, which was their record. So it's also a growing and thriving program. And now in combination with the great team that already exists here, I'm very fortunate to be able to come in and add my experiences and also add my enthusiasm. And I think all work with all of us working together, I think we can reach new heights for what is already an excellent and historic program. We were the first hospital to perform a transplant in Connecticut. S Dr. Henry Lowe performed that many years okay. ago. So there's a very strong history, which I think w we can be proud of. And even just being here for the first couple of weeks, it's, uh, it's an inspiration. So especially when you walk around the hospital and you can see that obviously many great things happen in these halls and these corridors, it's an inspiration and we can build on that and I'm very much looking forward to be able to contribute uh, to, the, to the program here at Hartford. Well, I think it's remarkable the work that you do in, in terms of um, selecting hearts and, and how they're analyzed um, and, and to see how they are useful in somebody. What specifically are you looking for when you're looking for that viable heart for someone? So, of course, we need to look at the heart's function. Mm -hmm. uh, we also, again, we need to match the characteristics of the donor to the recipient. And really, again, a lot of the focus is on the matching. Mm -hmm. That if we are using a heart from an older donor, we may sway away from using it into a very young recipient. Again, a lot of the focus is on matching donor to recipient. Mm -hmm. And when we look at the unique particular aspects of each donor and each recipient, hopefully, on many occasions, we're able to bring them together to come up with a suitable combination that provides somebody with a life-saving heart transplant. I want to talk about the allocation system okay. in the United States okay. and, and how organs are allocated. Talk to us a little bit about that process. Well, there were major changes about a year ago mm -hmm. that were introduced by uh, UNOS, which is the United Nations of Organ Sharing, which is our allocation system here in the United States. And those changes were really designed to provide <coughs> more timely access to heart transplants for those patients who were the most severely ill. So in many occasions, people develop very severe heart failure. They could develop it very quickly. And in the past, even those patients, even if they were on life support mechanisms in the hospital, were potentially having to wait two or three months before they could get a heart. And that's too long for people who right. may only have a week or two to live. So in that case, we were relying more <coughs> on mechanical circulatory support devices or artificial heart pumps to get them over the, their severe heart failure, their acute heart failure, recover them, and then get them to a point where they could have a heart transplant later mm -hmm. in life. Now. What's happened is there is a change in that the patients who are most unwell and those who end up, for example, in hospital, hospitalized for severe heart failure, who may be on life support devices or on strong medications to maintain them, they have a much quicker access now to heart transplants for two reasons. One, they are at a higher end of the waiting list, mm -hmm. but also they've, uh, UNOS has expanded the radiance or the distance to which a very severely ill patient can access an organ. So previously, we were limited to about 25 miles, a radius of 25 miles to find an organ for someone even if they were severely ill. Now for the sickest patients, we have a radius of about 500 miles to work with. So wow. we can go further. So wow. if there is a severely ill patient in Hartford, mm -hmm. there's now a much larger radius that we can potentially acquire an organ from. Whereas in the past, we would, be, would not have access to those organs which right. were beyond 25 miles. So that's a somewhat simplified view of how the locations work, but generally we can now travel longer distances to get our most unwell patients and our sickest patients transplanted. And preservation of the heart when it's when you're traveling that much farther um, because there is a timeline for impl implantation though. So e e e we are traveling a bit further mm -hmm. but not uh, even again within the design of this system we aren't traveling excessive distances where we'd be placing the organ at risk. So right. of course safety is always central to what everything that we do mm -hmm. when we're trying to match a donor heart to a recipient at the back of our mind is is this the safest and best thing to do for this patient? Right, right. So irrespective, of course, sometimes we'll, have, we'll accept hearts which may not be perfect and have characteristics which aren't ideal, but we're doing our best for the patient. We know that this organ will give them or hopefully give them a very good result. So all of those constraints are in our mind. So safety, of course, is paramount. And although we, the distances have increased in where we'll travel, they still aren't beyond what's uh, capable or what's logistically feasible for delivering transplant. Right. Um, I, I want to uh, talk about the, the process of, of heart transplantation. It is so complex and there's so many moving parts to it that everything has to align perfectly and has to be in synergy. 
blood type, yeah. the condition, uh, gender. There's so many things that come into play. Uh, talk to us about the, the process of a heart transplant and finding that perfect heart for someone. So once, so again, I, I mentioned that we're continuously receiving organ offers. Mm -hmm. And when we're fortunate enough to be able to find an offer that matches to our recipient's needs, we accept that offer. And then again, it's a complex m machine that starts to work. Right. There's a lot, again, you said there's a lot of moving parts. The patient, if they're not already in hospital, patient comes into hospital, the team start to prepare the patient for surgery, everybody starts to get ready for the transplant procedure. And we spend, one of our colleagues, one of our surgical colleagues will tra travel to the site where the organ donor is located and actually do the final checks on the donor, which uh, culminates with them actually being in the operating room and visually inspecting the heart prior to procuring the heart and removing it for a transplant. And, and that's an important role because they're visually inspecting the, yeah. the heart function. What if at that point that surgeon decides this might not be a good match? In, in that case, we're able to uh, decline the transplant and we make sure, again, the communication is so important. We have to be in communication throughout this entire process and uh, we do not commit the patient to something that we can't recover from right. until we're absolutely sure that the heart's fine and that's inclu including a visual inspection of the heart. So again, that's part of the process. But again, as you mentioned, it's complex, but at the same time, the procedure, what we're trying to do is very simple. Mm -hmm. We simply have to remove a diseased heart and implant a new heart with, with good function. And in terms of the technical things that we do as cardiac surgeons, uh, technically it's not always the most challenging thing to do because we're removing one heart and we're doing relatively large suturing compared to some of the final work we do as cardiac surgeons. But it's again, it's just a complex interplay of people, systems, and processes which get us to that point. Right. But and again, it's, it's in many ways, it's also beautifully simple. And I tell that to patients, that it's complicated when you think of all the aspects involved. Right. But what we're trying to do for you is really simple. Right, but yeah. the, the actual procedure itself. Uh, the procedure so itself, yeah. of course, it's a, 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 it's a, a technical procedure mm -hmm. which requires us to remove the diseased heart, which yeah. we call a cardiectomy. And then simply what we do is we just connect, connect the bits. What we've removed, we have, we, we um, surgically join all the major blood vessels and also the rem, all the major heart chambers in order to uh, implant the heart and so that it can support the circulation. And, and once that's done, can the, the patient be taken off the heart-lung bypass yeah. machine? So once the actual suturing or the mechanical joins of the recipient heart and the remnants of the previous heart are completed and the joints are done, then we wait for the heart to recover its function. The heart has to wake up. It's often been transported from a considerable distance, so it sometimes takes a little bit of time to recover its function. So we watch carefully. We give some medication to support that. And then we will remove the patient from the heart-lung machine, which is what we uh, install or um, what we um, support patients on while they're waiting. Because of course, when we remove the heart, there's a period where the patient has no heart. Right. The circulation, the respiration is supported by a heart-lung machine, which circulates bl oxygenated blood throughout the body. And that's connected to the, to the major blood vessels within the patient. So once the transplant procedure is technically completed, we would then slowly remove the heart-lung machine. And at that time, the blood is diverted to the new heart. And so the heart takes over and you actually separate the patient from the heart-lung machine, and the heart takes over the responsibility for, for supporting the circulation. So it's, of course, it's a fantastic thing to yeah, see. Yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. Yeah. I, I've seen a, a kidney transplant, yeah. and I've seen the organ uh, going in, and once it's connected, it, it, it starts out as gray, but then once mm -hmm. the blood flows, it, it turns like a pinkish, yeah. reddish color. It's it, completely fascinating. It's always fascinating. fascinating, and of course, unfortunately, sometimes the new heart doesn't work well, mm -hmm. and that is one of the risks of heart transplantation, right. and we do see that on occasion, what we call primary graft dysfunction, where the new heart just doesn't work well, and unfortunately, that's one of the things that can sometimes cause a negative outcome. Right. But still, we have many uh, mechanisms or many pr processes to support. Even if the heart doesn't work well straight away, we do have options to support that heart, again, with life support systems, mm -hmm. because sometimes the heart may take a few days to recover. So right. again, that's how complex it is. I said it's simple in some ways, but we have a lot of tricks up our sleeve to be able to allow even a heart that may not be functioning ideally to begin with to recover function over the forthcoming days. So to people recover, to, f to restore to full function. To restore to full function. So yeah. let's say that it does, um, you have full function. Mm -hmm. is, does the chance of rejection still go up even after the patient uh, days later? How, or when are you sort of out of the woods in terms of rejecting the organ? Uh, so usually rejection doesn't occur within the first few days unless it's very severe. Mm -hmm. But over the course of the next few, in the, within the first year after heart transplant, the major dangers to the patient after they've successfully had a successful technical procedure with a heart that's working well, 
the risks over the first year are mainly from those two things, from infections and from rejection of the heart. Because first of all, people need to be on very powerful immune suppressive drugs. Otherwise, their immune system will recognize the new heart as foreign and attack yes. it. Right. So in order, uh, so then there's a co again, there's a complex um, relationship between immune medications, immune suppressive medications, which suppress the immune system. But of course, that then opens the door to infections. Mm -hmm. So then you have to balance those two things very carefully. And that's what my colleagues who specialize in heart failure cardiology and transplant cardiology, that's what one of their main responsibilities is. It's not as simple as just doing a heart transplant and people go off and ride into the sunset. It's very careful maintenance and monitoring and observation, which keeps them alive. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, sometimes an that's understated critical. role of our heart failure cardiology colleagues because they have to very carefully balance Right. the immune medications right. and prevent infections from, for, uh, again, if you don't give them enough immune medication, immune suppressive medication, they'll suffer rejection. So it's a very careful balance. So sometimes people feel that oh, it's after a heart transplant or another organ transplant, people just go on That's to it. live normal they lives. Live. They live good lives, but right. they, they do need monitoring and observation. And we, we make sure obviously that patients understand that committing to a, a heart transplant or any other transplant is a lifelong commitment and a partnership with their, with their um, with their doctors and their physicians. Certainly a critical mm -hmm. step in monitoring going yeah. forward. Do Dr. Ali, we have a question from Samantha. She asks, what are the differences between symptoms of a heart attack in women versus men? Thanks, Samantha, for uh, the question. Thank you, Samantha, again, for the question. There often isn't much difference in symptoms between women and men. Um, in fact, one of the surprising things is that uh, you may not have many symptoms at all when you, you suffer heart attacks. So there are many people who suffer heart attacks without even knowing it and they go on to find on later on that they may have had a heart attack if they've had issues in the future or have they, an ECG. But the common symptoms of a heart attack are chest pain, feeling very breathless, sometimes feeling sweaty and flushed. And again, some of the symptoms of suffering a heart attack or angina or chest pain or heart pain from a lack of blood supply to the heart, they mirror a lot of the symptoms that you sometimes get with indigestion. So sometimes people just think they have a bad bout of indigestion, but they might actually be suffering a heart attack. So uh, those are the common symptoms, but again, you can have no symptoms but there really isn't a, a major difference in symptoms based on uh, sex mm -hmm. or gender. <clears throat> Let's talk about um, uh, heart failure. We, we talked briefly about that, but artificial heart pump versus heart transplant. Um, you, you do both, obviously. Yeah. How, how do you select or how do you determine when somebody could be on the pump versus this patient's yeah. gonna need transplantation? So we do that again as a team. We've got a very good multidisciplinary team, which involves cardiologists, cardiac surgeons, a lot of our nurses and our coordinators, and each patient who has severe heart failure, potentially that's an option for most patients, either to have a heart transplant or an artificial heart pump. So we discuss it with the patient first. A lot of patients opt for a heart transplant because mm -hmm. it's a biological solution to their problem. But again, the logistics of a heart transplant is that it's not available immediately. Right. So it's not something that we can pull off the shelf, whereas the artificial heart pumps are available to us on the shelf. And we can if that is the treatment that's required, if people in severe heart failure that needs to be treated immediately, we could do that with an artificial heart pump. So the factors really depend upon uh, or the decision-making process is individualized to the patient. And they're not really two competing therapies. They're actually symbiotic. They work with each other. So in many cases, in fact, a mechanical heart pump or an artificial heart pump is implanted so that patients can recover their health and survive to get a heart transplant in the future, which right. we call bridging patients to a heart transplant. Mm -hmm. So they really work very well with one another. And then on some occasions, we decide that the artificial heart pump is going to actually be a permanent treatment for somebody. So they're not going to receive a heart transplant. So sometimes these patients are older or they've got other medical conditions which preclude heart transplant because right. we tend to restrict heart transplantation to people who don't have a lot of, of other illnesses. If you've got very bad lung disease or kidney disease or suffered strokes in the past and you're more debilitated, then you may not be able to recover well from a heart transplant or it may be harder for you to get a good outcome. So in those patients, then we have this other option of a mechanical heart pump where we can, are some t uh, somewhat less stringent on the criteria because again, those devices are available to us liberally, whereas donor hearts, again, are, are a um, limited resource. Mm -hmm. So we try to ensure that we're providing the people who are going to get the best outcome from them. And, and it can buy you some time, right, yeah, until certainly. a viable heart yeah, is found. Yeah, exactly. So right? as I said, the bridge to transplant strategy allows us to treat people with severe heart failure by implanting a mechanical heart pump, getting them out of the hospital, recovering mm -hmm. them from that procedure, and then they can go on to wait even at home mm -hmm. for many months or even years, living mm -hmm. a normal good life if they recover from the procedure well and they can be active and cycling and running and do all the other daily yeah. activities. And then hopefully they'll be fortunate enough that one day 
a suitable heart becomes available, and then we'll, rep uh, we'll transplant and remove the, their old heart along with the uh, implanted device and replace that with a heart transplant. When we talk about um, uh, younger uh, patients needing heart transplants in their 20s, and, mm -hmm. and we've, we've certainly seen mm -hmm. that here at, at Hartford Hospital, um, uh, and chances of them needing another heart later on in life, is that pretty much a, a possibility for, for younger so patients? Th the median time which a heart transplant lasts is around 15 years, and it's been getting progressively longer. So of course, if you're in your younger ages, if you're about 20 or 25, it's very likely that you may need another heart transplant at some point in your life. Although there are many patients now who are living 20, 25, 30 years after a heart transplant. Mm -hmm. So that is a possibility. Um, some of the, the commonest thing that causes a heart to decay over time, again, is rejection. Even if the rejection isn't what we call acute and sudden rejection, over the years, what we call a chronic rejection process might damage the heart. And that process can narrow the arteries of the transplanted heart, but, and it can slowly cause a decline in the heart's function so that after 10, 15, 20 years, the heart isn't working very well or has some issues that may require that patient to have another procedure or, or more medical treatment. We have another question, an anonymous question. Uh, I was told that abdominal fat increases the likelihood of a future heart attack. Is that true? Uh, well, thank you for the question. Uh, I don't think abdominal fat uh, particularly causes increased risk of heart attack, but of course there are risk factors for heart disease and elevated cholesterol and uh, related issues and risk factors for heart disease in general all combined to be increase the risk of uh, heart attacks and heart disease. Mm -hmm. So again, we're all aware of many of the lifestyle modifications that we can all make in order to reduce the risk of heart disease. And again, heart disease, although it's a major problem for our society and for us uh, as human beings, one of the good things about heart disease is that it's preventable. Right. And a lot of our attention now is in preventing heart disease. So of course, diet, exercise, all the things that we know, all the things that we read about or hear about on the television all the time, these are things that we can do to prevent heart disease. <coughs> and again, prevention is the best strategy. Of course, and if, if it's beyond prevention, there are medications and there are um, treatment uh, options available. So the conditions that, so again, when we talk about heart transplantation and severe heart failure, when people develop heart failure, they are no longer able to do the things that we take for granted. Mm -hmm. Go up a flight of stairs, go outside, take the dog for a walk. They start to get tired. It's like running out of steam. It's like the en engine, engine running out of steam. So in that case, in the initial stages, uh, we can be treated very well with medications. But again, by our cardiology, co the cardiology colleagues will treat them with very good medications. So cocktails of medications can keep, keep people going for a long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, for, for decades even, we can manage heart failure very well medically. It's only when we exhaust all those other options because heart failure unfortunately is progressive. Even if yeah. it's being well managed over five, 10, 15 years or sooner or later, eventually it progresses to a point where the medications just are no longer effective. And that's when uh, myself and other cardiac surgeons who deal with heart failure become involved in the discussion because we can offer these specialized surgical procedures such as transplantation and mechanical support in order to restore the, the health of the patient. Is heart failure, is, is that <clears throat> the biggest reason why people need heart transplants? What's the yep. sort of biggest catalyst that would lead somebody <coughs> to a heart transplant? So the two commonest diseases that res result in heart failure eventually requiring heart transplant, what we call ischemic heart disease, which is a lack of blood supply to the heart caused by narrowings of the coronary arteries, which lead to heart attacks and angina and chest pain. So ischemic heart disease is a major cause for what we call ischemic heart failure. And the other major uh, disease process which causes heart failure is what we call cardiomyopathies. This mm -hmm. is heart muscle disease which causes heart muscle weakness. Many of this is congenital or, or genetic component to it. It could be, um, there could be other c reasons for the heart muscle to weaken, such as toxic issue reasons, such as alcohol abuse, et cetera. Okay. So diseases that caught the heart, uh, cause the heart muscle to weaken, they can also result in the heart to coming dysfunctional and damaged to the point that severe heart failure occurs. And again, transplantation and mechanical uh, circuitry support devices become an option. Dr. Ali, we have a question from Rebecca. She asks, does the risk uh, for heart disease increase with the onset of menopause? Thanks for the question, Rebecca. Uh, thank you for the, uh, for the question, Rebecca. Yes, it does, of course. And again, this is some of the important uh, considerations when we're dealing with uh, um, heart health in women. And that itself is a, a very uh, special topic, which a lot of us pay attention to because there are some intricacies which are different between uh, different in men and women and there's separate risks of heart disease. So um, again, we're all individuals, whether we're male or female, but we, there are some particularities based on gender and size and even sometimes in 
um, our, our, our makeups that um, individually affect our risk of heart disease. Yeah, I mean, going through menopause, your, your body changes. Yeah. And so if, if, let's just say you're a woman who had, you know, rel relatively good cholesterol readings, yeah. uh, normal blood pressure, mm -hmm. can that all change when, when you hit menopause? Yeah, because there's a significant hormonal change in the yeah. body and that can all yeah. lead to changes in our blood biochemistry and also in our metabolism and can affect the risk of uh, heart disease. We have a question from Pamela asks, if a young person has heart failure, 30, and both valves are damaged, is a transplant or device going to be the best option? Thanks for the question, yeah, Pamela. Thank you again, Pamela, thanks for the question. Generally, uh, our first approach to dealing with damaged heart valves is to replace them. So if even if the heart has been damaged to a degree by the fact that it's been working with abnormal valves for, for a period of time, our initial step would be to replace those damaged heart valves or even to repair them. So that would be the first step. Sometimes when valvular heart disease is unchecked or even if it's been treated and the heart valves have been replaced, again, that could progress over time. And the end result may be that at some point when this all culminates, a heart transplant may be required if people develop severe heart failure from their valvular heart disease. But generally, the initial approach is to replace or repair those valves surgically. Or now, uh, surgically, we can also treat them through less invasive means as well. Getting a lot of questions here. Um, Heather asks, can regular cardiovascular exercise help prolong the degradation of transplanted of a transplanted heart? Thank you for your question. Again, as I said, the major process which results in transplanted hearts declining over time is an immunological one. Mm -hmm. But again, good exercise and a healthy lifestyle will be beneficial to us holistically, not, whether it's specific to one organ or not. So of course, I think in general, having that sort of lifestyle and having that kind of positive approach towards our own health will increase the, our own longevity, whether or not it's specific to the heart or not. I, I find it interesting in, in you know, you um, studying in England and, mm -hmm. and, and talking about the comparisons in terms of heart transplantation in England versus the U.S. Mm -hmm. and how in England um, they would think nothing of putting a 55-year-old mm -hmm. heart into someone there, where here uh, we might not do that. We have fewer organ donors in yeah. England. So in the United States, there are 25 organ donors per million population, whereas in the United Kingdom, we only have about 10 organ donors per million population. So we have a much more limited pool to choose from. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, also true of Europe. So because we have a much more limited pool, we still have patients with very severe heart failure who need life-saving transplants. So we have to look harder, and we have to use what's available to us. So again, that's one of the unique things about working in s different places and combining experiences, because I'm able to bring that experience now to the United States. Mm -hmm. And despite the fact that we look harder to find donor hearts and may use hearts that are slightly older or may come from people with some mild conditions such as diabetes and high blood pressure. Our results in Europe are akin to the results here in the United States. So we were able to get good outcomes with, with those sorts of hearts despite the fact that we have to look harder and we may end up taking organs which we consider to be somewhat extended because there is some criteria which make the heart not perfect. But we're not looking for perfect hearts. We're just looking for hearts that are going to be able to support the circulation of our patients and give them a good outcome over the longer term. And it does not have to be a perfect, pristine heart from a very y young, healthy individual. It could be someone older. It could be someone with the kind of conditions that we all walk around with, high blood pressure, diabetes, as long as those conditions haven't impacted the heart. And before we accept any donor heart, we very carefully investigate it. So we've got all the investigations. We have an angiogram to look at the heart arteries. We do echocardiograms and heart scans to look at the size and thickness of the heart, the function of the heart. So we already have a gamut of information. And if everything looks good to us on that data, then we will not necessarily be worried about uh, one thing or another if we're happy with the function. Well, I think it's so incredi mm. incredibly important to talk about that because we, we sort of use these discussions as education for the viewers watching because that is certainly something that you don't hear of. I think if a, if a patient uh, is told, or if I'm a patient and I'm in my uh, needing a heart transplant and I find out that the, my donor is was age 55, because you're educated and, mm. and you know that, that that is a viable option, that just because it's a 55-year-old heart, it could be the perfect heart for me. Yeah. Um, so I think it's important to really educate um, when people th think age, oh my gosh, you know, I'm going to end up needing another heart transplant. Yeah. Um, so I think it's really important to, to hammer Again, it's home. about matching that donor heart to the recipient. Yeah. So I wouldn't... Uh, uh, actively transplant a 55-year-old donor heart into someone, for example, who may be 25. Yeah. But a lot of our patients on the waiting list are mm -hmm. between the ages of 50 and 70, so that would be a perfect heart for them. Right. 
Another question from Doreen. Uh, can you talk about the strain on the heart due to chronic conditions such as diabetes or chronic pain? Well, Thanks thank, for the question. Yeah, thank you again, Doreen, for the question. So diabetes, of course, is a major um, contributor to heart disease. We know diabetes, high blood pressure, tobacco smoking, family right. history. These are the classical risk factors for heart disease. So uh, if diabetes is poorly controlled or not managed well, then that can lead to the development of heart disease. It can cause coronary artery disease, and uh, it can contribute to many of the uh, issues which result in ischemic heart disease, which of course can eventually c result in heart attacks and heart failure. Another question from Rebecca. I have had the chance to watch a transplant surgery and felt like I was watching a miracle take place, which it really is. Um, as a surgeon, what is it like to see that new heart begin to beat? There must be nothing else like that, really. Again, yeah, thank you for your uh, comment and your question. It's still the most exciting part of doing a heart transplant. It's the, the favorite operation that I do. I love doing heart transplants, of course. And um, we're very focused when we're doing the transplant because we're suturing. And, and we're trying to suture efficiently and effectively, and we kind of block out everything else. But that point where we provide the new heart with blood, we have a clamp placed on the heart while we're sewing the heart on so that the heart doesn't get blood until we've completely finished all the joining. Then when we remove that clamp and blood enters the new heart, and you can see that the heart starts to generate some activity. When that heart actually starts to beat, it's very reassuring and mm -hmm. it's, it's, a very, it's a great thing to see, especially as we can see that it's starting to beat with vigor. Mm -hmm. And then also we, we sort of relax a little bit because of course, unfortunately, there are those proportion of hearts we've talked about that sometimes don't work well straight away. Yeah. So when we see the heart visually functioning and beating well, it, you know, it obviously it encourages us. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And she says, thank you for all that you do. Um, Betsy Thank says, you. I started having heart palpitations recently that turned out to be caused by stress and caffeine combined with menopause. Can you explain how menopause affects your heart? Thank you for that question. I think we, we talked about this already. As a con mm -hmm. It seems like it's a common uh, yeah. concern of some people, but mm -hmm. unfortunately there are hormonal changes that occur after pregnancy, uh, sorry, after menopause, and those hormonal changes can contribute to an increased risk of heart disease. So that's why I think it's important to be in touch with your doctor and to uh, ensure that you're doing everything that you can to minimize your risk of heart disease. And, and pregnancy too, yeah. you, you, uh, yeah. it, there are changes yeah. there as well. And sometimes, unfortunately, pregnancy can be associated with acute heart failure or severe heart failure. And uh, we do often come across these patients, and of course, they're quite complicated to deal with. Um, so there's lots of niches and lots of uh, different patient groups that we're dealing with when we're talking about severe heart failure. Um, Berth asks, how long does a heart transplant last? Um, again, we mentioned the average uh, time a heart transplant lasts is around 15 years, what we call the median survival time of a heart transplant. But there are many patients who are living with a heart transplant after 25 or even 30 years. I think the first patient who was transplanted in this hospital um, ha has a very good longevity with his yeah. heart transplant mm -hmm. over many decades. Many decades, yes. Um, I know someone who has end-stage heart failure and her heart is only working at 10 to 15 percent. She is very young in her early 20s. Is it possible her heart will repair itself through proper diet, exercise, and medications? Uh, well, thank you for that question. It's not common that you can actually recover function. Mm -hmm. So the heart, unfortunately, is depressed and dysfunctional. But again, we go back to the work that our heart transplant or our heart failure cardiologists do, and they're able to take patients like this who have a severely dysfunctional heart, and actually through the right combination of medications, they can live a, a good daily life, an active life, and work and do very well for many, many years. So mm -hmm. they don't need a heart transplant too early in life. We talked about a heart transplant being somewhat limited by its longevity. So we want to try and see if we can treat people conservatively with medications first and maybe reserve the heart transplant procedure for later in life so that they can get the best overall duration or longevity of life from the combination of medical therapy and uh, surgical therapy. We talked about heart failure really sort of being the, 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 the catalyst as to why people would need heart transplants, but some people develop Vi a virus that yeah. can lead to damage of the heart, ultimately needing a heart transplant. Yeah. Do you see that often, and, and how do you avoid that? I mean, we all get viruses. Yeah. How do you avoid uh, or prevent your heart from becoming damaged while you have a virus? So viral illnesses, unfortunately, can sometimes cause acute illnesses, and in a very small proportion of people, it can cause what we call a myocarditis, which is an inflammation of the lining of the heart, or the inside of the heart, the inflammation of the heart muscle. And uh, when viruses cause a severe myocarditis, the heart again becomes depressed in its function because of the viral infection. And under those circumstances, people develop acute, severe sudden heart failure. And it may be to the point where their heart's working very poorly. 
and they actually need life support mechanisms, artificial machines or artificial pumps in order to support their circulation. So it's not common, but we do see it. And uh, again, when we're dealing with specialized heart failure, it seems like you see it more often because of course, right. when people do develop it, even if it's only a small number of people in the population, of course, they present, present to us in that mechanism, that mode, and we have to respond to them very quickly and very effectively in order to uh, recover them or maintain them or support them. In some cases, the, the heart recovers from that viral illness, but in other instances, the heart's severely damaged by the viral infection, and they may end up needing a heart transplant or an mm. artificial heart pump or, or, or a therapy. But again, in some cases, even if we need to put them onto life support, after temporary life support or temporary circulatory support, the heart recovers from the viral infection over a couple of weeks and we're able to remove them from that type of support and they're able to go back on and live healthy lives with their own hearts. So sometimes their hearts recover, unfortunately sometimes they don't and we just have to tailor our, our treatment and support to the individual patient. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know you, uh, combined here in, in the state of Connecticut last year over ab about 71 transplants were performed, heart transplants mm -hmm. were performed. You were mentioning about 50 or so are waiting on the list but as you transplant mm -hmm. more People come onto the yeah. list. Yep. So of course there are uh, severe heart failure or, or heart disease is again with the co one of the commonest mm -hmm. conditions that we see as doctors and heart failure is a very common diagnosis in the population and unfortunately not everybody gets access to doctors when they have heart failure and sometimes they present to their doctors too late. So if you are suffering symptoms which are common of uh, these uh, associated heart failure such as feeling tired, breathless, particularly if you've had heart disease in the past and you're swelling up with fluid. Those are the commonest symptoms that we see. And if you are feeling that way, it's best to get to your doctor because just some simple investigations and checkups can reveal that you've got heart failure and we can get to start to working towards can, treatment. And you can manage yeah. it properly yeah. uh, before it could. And the earlier we get to it, yeah. the more options that we have. Right. And we may be able to intervene more effectively with less invasive therapies and medical therapies and get people out of the damaging cycle of heart failure, which is when you are in heart failure and as it progresses, our entire bodies are getting less blood flow than they should, so our other organs also are deprived of, of blood flow. Right. Sometimes our kidneys start to work less well, and again, our whole body starts to slowly shut down. So if you can intervene earlier, mm -hmm. then you can recover the patients more quickly, and you can have a greater scope of being able to remain well with more and limited and less invasive therapies like medications. And potentially avoid a heart transplant, yes, yeah. eventually. Um, mm -hmm. Another uh, anonymous question, why does your body retain so much fluid when you have heart failure? Again, the heart is a simple pump working in a circuit with pipes and tubes. So again, in many ways, it's just like plumbing. Mm -hmm. So the heart has to move the fluid around the body. Now when the heart becomes ineffective as a pump, fluid starts to accumulate on the body, what we call edema fluid. So that's one of the common symptoms that people get is the, their tissues, their skin, and their, sub, their tissues underneath the skin, they start to become waterlogged because the heart is just not effectively moving the blood around the circulation. So that's the reason that people develop edema or swelling of their, of their, of their tissues. Known as congestive heart failure? Congestive heart failure, yeah. yeah. So edema or swelling is one of the common signs uh, that you see in heart failure. Um, Michael asks, what is the success rate for a heart transplant? Good question, Michael. Thank so you. Thanks, Michael, for that question. So uh, we categorize the success of a heart transplant by whether people survive the procedure. And there are a couple of uh, time points that we look at specifically. One is 30 days. So generally, if people have survived 30 days after the heart transplant, they've had a successful technical procedure. And so the 30-day survival for heart transplant in the United States is somewhere between 97 and 98 percent. That's very high. Uh, compared to uh, in Europe, it's probably about 95%. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons it's probably a little bit higher in the United States is because we're a little bit more conservative in who we select heart transplants for. Mm -hmm. So uh, anywhere between 95 to 98% would be an acceptable survival following a heart transplant. Of course, when you're performing transplants in people who are sicker, mm -hmm. who are on life support mechanisms, the risk of, of that heart transplant is greater. So they're more, they're more likely to possibly have a negative outcome after heart transplant. So although that's the average that we see in the whole group, your risks may be higher depending upon your particular situation and your particular severity of illness. Then we look at the one-year survival, which is, one again, one of the important benchmarks for heart transplant. The one-year survival for heart transplants in the United States is about 90%. Here at Hartford Hospital, it's 94%. So it's in excess of, th of the nation. So we're doing extremely well with our heart transplant program here and delivering very high quality uh, results. And then we also look at the longer-term outcomes at three years and five years and 10 years. In general, about 65 to 70 percent of people are still alive 10 years after heart transplant. So it is really a good, excellent long-term option in people who without a heart transplant might only survive a year or two, if not less. 
Wow, incredible. Another anonymous question, are other organs in the body affected by heart disease? To some extent, when we're, as we talked about, when we have severe heart failure, normally our heart pumps about five liters of blood around our body per minute. That's mm -hmm. what we call the normal cardiac output. Of course, it's bigger if you're a bit larger. It might be a little bit lower if you're smaller. But when you have severe heart failure, you're, uh, much less blood is flowing around the body, sometimes as little as two and a half to three liters. So when that's the case, our organs are deprived of blood flow and blood supply, and many of their organs start to become dysfunctional. The kidneys are a very common organ to start to become dysfunctional after severe heart failure sets in. So all just our, everything is just slowed down and starts to break down and deteriorate. So of course, all of our organs potentially can be affected by severe heart failure. What do you see in terms of the future for heart uh, transplantation, in terms of heart failure, as, as seems to be the main culprit in terms of why people need heart transplants, but do you think in the future uh, it, we have a good handle on that in getting people um, medicated to where they may not need a heart transplant, or do more people need to come forward when they have heart failure? What, what do you see happening in terms of the numbers? Again, prevention is very important. Mm -hmm. We talked about prevention. If we prevent heart disease at the outset, then we'll have less people with heart failure. Right. Medications will continue to improve. And again, we will continue to also innovate surgical therapies. I think artificial heart pumps will continue to improve. At the moment, artificial heart pumps are limited by the fact that they need to be powered. And so there are cords which externally exit the body and are attached to battery packs that we wear on belts or another paraphernalia. But those have all been progressively getting smaller over the years, so they're easier to manage. But very soon, hopefully, we'll be able to eliminate the power cords so that we have a completely internal system which can run on energy through the skin. So technology will continue to improve artificial heart pumps so they'll become even more amenable to us for, uh, for their use and the risks associated with them in terms of the breakdown and infection of prosthetic parts outside the body. All of those will decline as m better devices are engineered. So of course that's a fantastic resource and it'll be very exciting to see how that technology develops over the future. And also we are, are innovating heart transplantation by um, looking at better methods of preserving organs. Currently, the conventional way we preserve a heart when we remove it from an organ donor is to flush it with cold preservation fluid and then to also transport it in very cold preservation fluids in a cooler. And it gets transported over many di significant distances. We are now starting to use devices which are actually mechanical devices that keep the heart pumped and perfused with blood. So the heart, after it's removed from the organ donor, is placed on this device and the device pumps the heart with blood and essentially keeps the heart perfused and oxygenated, oh. and that allows the heart to uh, remain viable for even longer periods of time because the heart hasn't been deprived of blood supply. So we're using these devices more and more often, and um, they're soon to be approved for use in this country. They're used throughout the world already, um, and this promises to be very useful for us in terms of being able to accept and consider donor organs that we otherwise wouldn't. wouldn't. For example, we can go to further distances. So if there's a heart in Texas, which is about a five-hour flight away, that would be a little bit too long to remove a heart and procure it in the conventional sense by transplanting it through cold preservation fluids. Right. But if we have this device, we can take the device to Texas, we can place the heart onto the device, and we can travel further distances and still have a viable heart. So you're talking 12 hours currently um, to get that heart transplanted. What would we be no, talking about with 12 uh, hours is the whole process. It's the whole process. Yeah, the whole yeah. process. Yeah. Generally, if we start out the heart transplant process, it's about 12 or 18 hours before the heart transplant is actually performed. Mm -hmm. But in terms of how long the heart can remain out of the body right. before I it is no longer viable, we start to get a little bit cautious if the time outside of the body between it being removed from the donor and planted the recipient is greater than around four hours. Four now, hours. I've yeah. successfully used hearts up to five hours. In Australia mm -hmm. and countries where there are longer distances to travel, they've used hearts up to six hours. Wow. Uh, but that starts to become a little bit more risky in terms of the heart being uh, subjected to a longer time without blood supply, and those hearts are more likely to not work well right. immediately when they're perfused with blood. So the risk of what we call primary graft dysfunction, which we talked about, is higher if the hearts are procured from a further distance mm -hmm. and are exposed to a longer period of time before they're transplanted. But with a device that you With a device, yeah, with a device, we would immediately remove the heart, place it onto this device, which pumps and perfuses the heart mm -hmm. with blood, so the heart I is not incurring the same degree of injury as if it didn't have a blood supply. Right. So we could probably, I mean, in that situation, we've used these devices to keep the hearts and maintain them for eight or 10 hours before they're actually wow. transplanted. Wow, so you can go yeah. for greater distances. Yeah. 
Well, so many exciting things to come. We are yeah. so happy to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for an enlightening uh, conversation no, in pleasure. terms thanks of heart transplantation yeah. um, and cardiac surgery. So, thank Dr. Ali, thank you for joining well, us. Again. And thanks. of course, thank you so much for joining us today. For more information about all that we've talked about and about the Hartford Healthcare Heart and Vascular Institute, call 833-444-0014. I'm Hartford Healthcare's okay. Tina Verona. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you soon.